Shalom, and uh, welcome to a Jerusalem Dispatch ICJ UK live. I'm in a different location, you can tell from uh, behind me, but also today is a very significant day because that today is D-Day. It's the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings that marked the beginning of the end of Nazi tyranny in Europe. And so many allied, allied forces and soldiers uh, lost their lives on the beaches of Normandy in order to defend our freedoms today. And Israel is fighting against a similar ideology that is an Islamist, not the esque ideology today. And Israel's facing an existential threat. And in this program tonight, so we have a very special guest uh, joining us from the Netherlands, Andrew Tucker from Think. Um, you shall be discussing what is known as the as lawfare, the legal battle against Israel that's currently being waged, as we see this with the International Criminal Court and the International Criminal Court of Justice, as well as attacking Israel for its for the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria, which is the biblical heartland of Israel, as we all know. So I'm going to hand over to, to Mark. I'm sorry, I'm having to use my uh, Samsung Galaxy, having a few uh, IT issues here tonight. So hopefully it will last uh, the duration. But uh, I'll hand over to you, Mark, to give us an update on the ministry that is the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem. Uh, and also just to share with us the important significance of having Andrew Tucker joining us from the Netherlands today. Well, hello, Simon, and hello to all of our viewers. Wonderful uh, to have you joining us. Um, we're not in quite the sort of beautiful location that Simon is, but here in the UK, fantastic that you're able to join us. Now, the last uh, month or so, uh, the ICJ UK branch has been busy. We've had some great conferences, the Southern Conference, uh, took place in Southampton uh, with the theme uh, God and Israel at War, uh, with a remarkable ministry by Dr. David Elms, uh, just unpacking this theme. And we'd love you to be able to go onto our website and find the links for where you can access that ministry. Now, later in July, we're going to have another set of events. In fact, Simon, I think on the 6th of July, you're going to be in Northern Ireland and sharing with our uh, UK um, ICJ family over there. And then on the 20th of July, something really special as we host an event in Edinburgh entitled Israel from a Different Angle. And the keynote speaker at this event will be Salim Shalash, from the home of Jesus, the King Church in, of course, Nazareth. And then Salim will also be in Belfast on the 27th for another event in Northern Ireland. Now, of course, all of this information is available on the ICJ UK website, and you can go and look there under events and be able to get the details of, of where the venue is and registration and all of that information. So let's pray for tonight. Lord, we thank you that as we come together in your wonderful name, that we are reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 2, where he said, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Lord, we're very aware at this time of the battle that we are in the midst of a struggle that things are accelerating toward the end and we feel the urgency of the hour. But we also take heart that you warned us that this would happen. And we encourage ourselves in the fact that you are both the Lord of history and of time and that you hold the seals of divine authority in your hand. Nothing happens without your divine 
permission and control. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon Andrew tonight. And we ask that you would strengthen the resolve of all who watch and listen tonight to not be silent and to not be intimidated. Indeed, the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much for praying for tonight's proceeding. As you know, the International Christian Embassy in uh, Jerusalem, UK, is doing an incredible job in standing in solidarity with Israel and the Jewish people at this extremely difficult time in Israel's history, particularly after the horrific events of October the 7th. But, but the ministry of ICJ UK has actually partnered with uh, one of Israel's uh, leading emergency services known as Magin Davidadom, meaning the uh, Red Ambulance Service or the Star of David, as it's called, Magin, uh, uh, Star of David, or as the Israelis like to call it, Mada or MDA. Uh, we have a branch in the UK called MDA UK. So let's have a look at uh, uh, this remarkable and inspirational video really showing how that the ministry of ICJ UK has really blessed Israel by helping them and by providing them with much needed ambulances and medical equipment. Today we're at the Magen Davida Dome Blood Center in Ramla. We're here to tour the facility and to learn about their preparations in the medical field in Israel. And we're also here to dedicate a MediCycle that has been donated by our Christian friends around the world. We are just unveiling in a second this uh, uh, motor scooter that already saved the lives of 11 people, even though it's only one week old. Wow, here ICJ donated by the generous donation of the Korean family in Manitoba to Daraba. I think the most rewarding thing is the, the pure knowledge that whatever we do is to reach out a helping hand to a person in need. And it's even more fantastic when we learn that it changed their lives and are healing and are getting better. This is the most rewarding thing that any of us feel. I've been working with Christian supporters from Agenda Vidodon for many, many years. So to me, it's already something that, I don't know if the right term is used to, but still we admire because it's not taken for granted. And this is a very important support because people in Israel not always understand and know how much care, love and concern Christians from all over the world feel towards Israel as a country, to the people of Israel as human beings. And, and this type of support that Magen David Dome is receiving through Christian friends of Magen David Dome, through so many ministries and Christian organizations and so forth, is a lifesaver. Christians from all over the world are our partners in saving lives. They stand shoulder to shoulder with us when we reach out and treat other patients. Whether they are, have a heart attack or seizures or give a, 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 deliver a baby or they are hurt by car accident or terror attacks. They are all the time with us and we in Magenta Vida Dom feel their strength and their spirit. And I think this is the most important thing that people would know. We cherish the support, it's so important. We want to say a huge thank you to all of our friends around the world who have donated so generously to our Israel in Crisis Fund which is enabling us to help Israel in these difficult days with a variety of aid, whether it's these medical equipment or shelters or aid for evacuees or victims of terror or a whole variety of uh, assistance that Israel can use in these days. We wanna say thank you for giving so generously.
That was an incredible video showing how the ministry of ICEJ UK is really blessing Israel at this time by supporting the incredible work in saving lives being done by MDA, Magin Davidadom. And uh, we know that uh, many of the ambulances uh, caught up in the uh, horrific mass terrorist attack by Hamas on October the 7th. Hamas deliberately targeted Israeli ambulance. They deliberately shot their tires uh, and, they, and they killed over 11 Israeli paramedics on that day. And so now Israel is needing bulletproof ambulances. What other uh, national emergency service around the world actually now requires bulletproof ambulances? Well, Israel does. So let's also think about tonight's topic because we're talking about lawfare. We're talking about how international law has been used as a strategic weapon against Israel at this time. And this is a great introduction to our topic, but also to our guest, Andrew Tucker, and the incredible work that he does defending Israel in the arena of international law. Is Israel an apartheid state? Why is Israel violating international law again and again? Why is it so difficult to reach a two-state solution? And what does the future of Israel and the Middle East look like? Questions that many of us are asking ourselves. And that is why we are organizing a conference on the topic Israel on trial, taking place in The Hague, the Netherlands, on March 29 and 30, with experts from all over the world. You know, we are living in such a rapidly changing world. The environmental crisis, the war in Ukraine, the role of China, the regional unrest caused by Iran, these are just examples. And amidst all of this, it's amazing that year after year, just one tiny country, the state of Israel, gets so much attention in the media and politics worldwide. For example, last year the United Nations General Assembly adopted more resolutions criticizing Israel than all other countries combined. Why is that the case? The UN Human Rights Council has created a permanent commission of inquiry to investigate Israel. So that raises the question, is Israel indeed the worst human rights violator in the world? Well, actually, the position of Israel in the Middle East is extremely complex and volatile. To get a good understanding of this complex situation, it's essential to learn some basic elements about Israel from the legal level, the historical level and the political level. During our conference, leading experts in international law and international relations will explain and unpack the main legal, historical and political issues affecting Israel and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We will zoom in on the threats to the sovereignty of the State of Israel and what can be done to challenge these threats. Our keynote speaker at the conference is Hillel Neuer of UN Watch. And we have many other excellent speakers, including Professor Wolfgang Bock from Germany, Professor Gregory Rose from Australia, and Professor Stephen Zipperstein from the United States, and lots of other really excellent speakers. So for registration and more information on the topics and speakers, check our website. On March 29 and 30, we invite you to join us in The Hague. As you can see from uh, from the advert there, that conference has been uh, and gone. However, we have the man himself with us today, uh, Andrew Tucker, who's a good friend of mine. I've known him well over a decade um, in terms of his legal understanding of Israel and the situation that Israel faces in the arena of international law. I can't think of anyone better to introduce than Mark. Mark, do you would like to read out the very impressive biography of our special guest tonight for this live Jerusalem Dispatch a Zoom event with Andrew Tucker. Andrew, my pleasure just to read a few details about your story so far. Andrew Tucker was born and raised in Australia. He trained as a lawyer in Australia, UK and the Netherlands, where he practiced for almost 20 years as an attorney in the field of international law. 
from 2004 to 2018, Andrew served as executive director of Christians for Israel International based in the Netherlands. Since July 2018, Andrew serves as the international advisor. Now, Andrew is leading the establishment of the Hague Center for International Law and Public Policy in the Middle East, a think tank contributing to the development of freedom and justice in the Middle East based on the rule of law. Andrew is co-author of Israel on Trial and Two States for Two Peoples. A warm welcome to you, Andrew, uh, to Jerusalem Dispatch Live. Thank you so much, Mark. Great to be with you. Uh, Andrew, it's uh, great to see you again, and thank you so much for joining us from the Netherlands today. Sorry about the technical issues I'm having today, but uh, we, got, we got there in the end, and it's great to see you. But my first question to you, really, Andrew, is that we have to mark, I think, the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings that took place today. And without that, the sacrifice in blood by the Allied forces um, and the high price in blood that was paid to liberate Europe from Nazi tyranny, um, we wouldn't have the freedoms that we enjoy today. Just share with us the importance and the significance of this day, uh, D-Day, which is also known as uh, Operation Overlord, and how Israel is fi fighting against a similar ideology that represents Hamas, that is this Islamo-fascist ideology, uh, as Israel is facing a war for her survival against Hamas in Gaza. Thanks, Simon. Well, it's, um, it's, it's a very interesting analogy that you're drawing. I think, in a way, you're right, Israel is facing... Um, um, it, it, strangely enough, since October the 7th, um, a kind of tsunami of um of of um of warfare it it's remarkable that a country that was invaded by a genocidal regime is itself being accused of genocide mm -hmm. um anti-semitism is going through the roof worldwide jews i think globally are feeling um not only uncomfortable but scared afraid so we are, we are in in um, I think a, a watershed moment in the history of the Jewish nation, certainly of the state of Israel. And you're right; it's got something to do with a kind of a battle for freedom, a battle for our fundamental uh, values. And uh, in a way, I, I think you can compare it more with the sort of 1930s, where People sense something is going on. We don't quite know how things are going to play out, but there is uh, a power on the rise, um, you know, and I, and I think people in the 1930s, they didn't quite know how to take Hitler and his Nazi socialism, and nobody could have imagined what it would have led to. Um, but the lesson we have to learn is to take the warning signs seriously. And we're, we're seeing major warning signs of uh, an attack led by Iran, led by Qatar, led by these fundamentalist regimes in alliance with secular uh, materialist, uh, often largely neo-Marxist regimes, mm -hmm. which are undermining our fundamental Western values based on Judeo-Christian heritage. And, um, you know, I don't want to overplay the cards, but I, I, I think this is a really important moment in history. I couldn't agree more with you. But, but Andrew, do you want to share with us uh, where it all started for you? Uh, when, did, uh, when did you have a revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? And, and when did he put a real love and a passion on your heart for Israel and the Jewish people? Well, I, I, I grew up in a Christian family, Simon, so um, I suppose my Christian faith was, you know, born in the womb, really. Um, I don't have a moment in my adult life that I suddenly came to faith. I've had some pretty significant moments where I've come to a much deeper understanding. Um, I think one of the things was I was 
born into a family tradition where my forefathers already from the 1820s and 1830s were praying for the restoration of Israel. Yes. So I mean, I have prayer books in our bookshelves at home when I grew up with uh, beautiful prayers, praying that God would fulfill um, his promises in relation to Israel. And that this is critical to our Christian self-understanding of who we are and our place in in um, in in God's redemptive plan, um, which is a little different from I think the sort of you know Christian centric views that many have that you know it's all about the church and nothing else but the church and the church is the kingdom of God and which is true of course in in a, in a sense but if you miss out on what God is doing with Israel you miss out on I think um, ninety percent of the gospel. So I kind of grew up with that. Uh, I grew up also with a lot of Jewish people around me. I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, which is a, a very large Jewish community, Orthodox and non-Orthodox. Um, people around me were survivors of the Holocaust or they had fled to Australia before the Holocaust. So stories were, I guess, part of my um, my life growing up. Um, and, uh, but, but I didn't have much of an understanding, to be honest, about the modern state of Israel. And that, that really only came much later when I married into a family that, um, is very involved in Israel and gradually I was drawn into traveling to Israel, getting to know modern Israel. And that just changed my life really. Mm. amazing that's amazing so thanks thanks to your family that uh, your doctor family as well yeah. uh, and Andrew, also just, just share with us as well how the lord has been able to use your gifting and your understanding of law and international law and been able to use it in order to uh, protect israel and the jewish people when it comes to the international attacks that come through israel through what is known as lawfare right thanks simon so um uh i i i sort of started you know i think perhaps when you and i first sort of met it's it's almost 20 years ago now um working in brussels your call with the european coalition for israel and starting to grapple with um israel's legal position and we could all sense back then that the legal system was being sort of um used in a way to undermine the state of state of Israel. Uh, it's, international law is is very political, as you know, it's really all about politics. Um, the international legal system's barely a legal system at all. It's uh, uh, it's you can't, you almost can't compare it with a domestic or national legal system which has checks and balances. it has, um you know it has a judiciary an independent judiciary it has an executive um and it has a legislature that you know you know in a healthy democracy they they balance each other out don't they you don't have that in the international legal system you have a bunch of states who make up the rules as they go along and that's what we call international law it is a system and it's an important one and i think we should cherish it um but we shouldn't put our faith in it. We shouldn't hope or pretend that the legal system is going to protect us. Uh, it certainly didn't in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, every legal system is prone to manipulation and misuse, and the, and the international one um, is particularly fragile and prone to, to misuse. So I think my my work has been to try and understand this and research it and write about it um, and to push back a little bit against the sort of globalist agenda, which says that everything that the UN does is is by definition good and it's going to save the world. Well, it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. On the contrary, we know that the Antichrist is going to use that system. He is using the system. 
And we need to be aware of and awake to to all of this. And and Andrew, are you 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 are in the Netherlands right now? To share with us the uh, the battle that Israel faces in the Netherlands, but also um, how are the Jewish community there also dealing with the after effects of October seventh, with this huge rise of Jew hatred that we haven't really seen since the nineteen thirties. Netherlands is an interesting country. It's a very small country. Um, most people don't know where it is. I didn't know really where it was until I <laughs> came here. I, you know, the stories of the little boy with his finger in the dike. Mm. Um, uh, but it's a significant country. Um, you know, it's the place where the Plymouth Brethren came to um, and they sailed from the shores um, of the Netherlands. It's been a home for the Jewish people who, when they were evicted from Spain and the UK, many found their way to the Netherlands and from here to other parts of the world. It's been known for its tolerance. It's been known for its open um, economy, its open legal system and its entrepreneurial spirit. It's been a small but active player on the world stage. It even had a <laughs> you know, a century where it was a really a great world power with colonies all over the world. So um, it has a culture, a strong Christian culture, Calvinist, um, Protestant culture, as well as Roman Catholic. And um, I think the Jewish people have felt um, a degree of protection here. On the other hand, it is the country with the highest number of Jews in the Second World War, percentage-wise, who were shipped off to Auschwitz. Um, I think over 90% of the Jews in the Netherlands were exterminated. So they worked, the, 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 um, the bureaucracy worked closely with the Nazis here. Um, they didn't welcome the Nazis by any means, but there was a resistance, but it wasn't enough to protect the Jews. Now, I think the Jews today are feeling a little bit in the same position. The country um, is struggling with uh, immigration. It's struggling with, um, I think, the Islamist um, influence and a very secular mindset. Um, and I think the Jews, I, I spoke at a conference, a Jewish conference just a week or so ago here, and, and you could sense the kind of anguish and fear in the hearts and minds of the Jewish community. Uh, they're feeling th very threatened. Just this week, the European Jewish Association had its annual conference here and in Amsterdam, and they expressed their um, dismay at the rise of anti-Semitism and European Union's failure to push back. And the Netherlands is really part of the EU structure, you know. They see their future as very much part of the EU, and I think it's pushing them in that direction. On the other hand, we have a, a, a now a new government, a very centre-right government, which is going to... Um, introduce big changes. One of them is they want to introduce Holocaust education back into the secondary schools. Mm. Hasn't been taught well enough for the last decades and people realize we need to know more about our own history. So it's an interesting country. And then um, the other thing is it's the home to these international legal institutions in The Hague. Mm. So The Hague is a very important city in that respect internationally. And The Hague has been, uh, the Netherlands has been the host uh, for over 100 years of the international courts in the Peace Palace. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a huge responsibility, I think. Absolutely. Can I just, can I just add one thing that I think uh, you've forgotten that one? Um, this August will be the 80th anniversary of the arrest of Anne Frank, who literally became this symbolic figure 
of the Holocaust. And of course, having been to the Anne Frank Museum, you see the tiny living conditions that her and her family were in above her father's business. Uh, and sadly, she was betrayed uh, by neighbors, but the rest of those who worked in the factory did all they could to keep the family safe. Mm. Yes, there, there, look, there was a beautiful resistance work uh, in this country for sure. And, um, you know, many, um, are recognized uh, as righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem. You'll see a lot of Corrie ten Boom um, and her family, you know, were, were amongst them. So there is this wonderful tradition, I must say, that's been very important and a strong relationship with Israel and the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, yeah, Andrew, would you just describe for us how the Lord's led you to establish a, um, a very effective and very, very important uh, legal organization called the Think, uh, the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, and how this is really making a big difference and giving Israel a voice when it comes to international law and fighting these legal battles that she's currently facing that have been intensified since October the 7th? Yes, well, as I said, we the work that, that we were doing, particularly in Brussels and a little bit in New York and the UN, just showed us how important the legal warfare against Israel is. And um, a number of us felt over a period of time that we need uh, some kind of dedicated think tank outside Israel, outside the United States, that could be really... Uh, looking into this issue. And I feel as Christians, actually, we have a kind of obligation to be in that space. And I'm blessed with being a lawyer, or I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but I am a lawyer, so I have to make the best of it. Um, and I, you know, I felt that I should do something with this and, and really uh, stand in that place where I think Israel needs allies. It needs people um, in the public space who can be standing in the gap advocating uh, for um, for Israel, for the Jewish people and for everything it stands for. So that's why we created Think in 2017. We started by bringing together a group of lawyers to the Peace Palace. Um, I don't know if, if our viewers have been there. It's in a remarkable building in The Hague built before the First World War as the home of peace to be a place where um, uh, with the vision of Isaiah 2 that the nations would train for war no, war no more and justice and righteousness would be established on earth by having an institution that would decide and on conflicts between nations. Well, we know we've had a century of war like never before so it hasn't really been a great success but it's the home of the uh, the international court of justice and this is a very important institution and since 2000 the hague has been the home of the international criminal court as well as well as many other multinational uh, institutions and ad hoc criminal tribunals like the former Yugoslavia tribunal, the Rwanda tribunal, and so forth. So it has this rich history of international law. And we felt that The Hague is the place where think should be born. So we brought lawyers together to meet in the Peace Palace and draft a statement, which really is the founding document that we use. And it's simply arguing for fairness and justice and uh as we would say in australia giving israel a fair go you know um treating israel no better or no worse than any other state um and trying to push back against the um the wave of anti-israel lawfare in the un institutions particularly mm -hmm. Uh, and Andrew, um, sadly, on October the 7th, uh, it, what happened on October the 7th not only changed Israel, but also changed the world. I mean, this was the biggest mass terrorist attack in Israel's history, uh, that more Jewish people were massacred on October the 7th by Hamas uh, than they did 80 year, one single day 80 years ago during the Second World War. So we're talking about the murder of over 1,200 people. 
between uh, six and 7,000 people injured, over 250 taken hostage um, to Gaza. And having seen the footage myself, uh, mm. just absolutely sickening and horrific. And having visited kibbutz near Roz and seen the devastation uh, that occurred on October the 7th, you just understand the sheer magnitude of what happened. Uh, and uh, of course, Israel hasn't experienced anything like this in history. Share with us where you were on October the 7th and when you first became aware of the mm. horrors that were unfolding in Southern Israel. Well, uh, as it turns out, I was in a synagogue in Melbourne celebrating Shimchat Torah. Mm. And it was the end of the afternoon down in Australia and the service had just finished. It was a messianic uh, uh, Jewish community, beautiful service, um, worship, singing. You know, Shimchat Torah is the, is the great day of joy in the beginning of the year. People were uh, in high spirits and then as we're coming out, the messages started to uh, drip in on our phones. So this must have been early morning Israel time. And I was with my dear friend, Johannes Gerloff, who lives in Jerusalem. Uh, he's a wonderful German theologian and his children serve in the IDF. And they were um, starting to realize that something quite significant was, was happening so I agree with you. This is a, a massive, um, uh, of course, it's not just October the 7th. It's, it's, that was the culmination, I think, of, of years and years of preparation. And um, it was intended to be an invasion of Israel. They, um, and I, th I think you're right to say it was a watershed moment in many ways. Uh, and Andrew, um... We, we hear this term lawfare, and it's certainly being applied against Israel, the use of international law as a strategic weapon to erode Israel's moral standing in the world, but also Israel's ability to defend herself against genocidal terrorist organizations like Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah or any other Iranian terror-backed uh, proxy. But share with us um, in the context of what lawfare means in terms of the deployment of law as a weapon against the one and only Jewish state, which is Israel? Well, I mean, lawfare is not a strange phenomenon. We It happens every day in every legal system, right? The law is used by everybody to achieve particular objectives. So uh, the concept of lawfare, which is a play on words, warfare, using law to, to wage war, um, also happens in the international system, uh, well beyond the Israel context. Um, states use it. Israel uses it. Israel uses the legal system to av advance its own um, objectives. So there's nothing wrong with um, the use of the legal system. Um, what is problematic is when it is used for purposes for which the system itself was never established, right? And this is the problem of the international legal system. Um, so you take, you know, the classic example at the moment is the Genocide Convention, for example, which was never intended to deal with the situation we have in Gaza. Um, and it's true, I think, even of the United Nations Charter itself, which was a well-meaning document established um, for better or for worse, many of the authors of the charter were Jewish. There was a stream of thought within Jewish legal world at the time that the UN was going to be the protector and savior of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. It was going to prevent uh, catastrophes like the Holocaust from happening again. And the great legal jurists, Jewish legal jurists of the 20th century, put their faith in, and they still do. Uh, many leading Israeli and Jewish lawyers believe strongly in the United Nations system and that Israel should be part of this system and find its uh, future and protection within the system. Um, I think we're seeing that that's a failed 
strategy. It's a failed vision. Um, and the reality is that there are hostile forces out there. There are enemies of truth, enemies of freedom. And you mentioned Iran, I think, is one of them, uh, an important one at the moment, deliberately using the system to uh, undermine Israel. And, and it's a wake-up call for, for Israel as well. Uh, we've been very involved in what's going on in the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, and I can see that Israel is, and even its own leadership, is starting to realize that um the system itself is failing them and that unless the system is reformed radically the jewish people are going to have to fight for themselves and that's a very difficult place to be in um legally we'll talk a little bit more about how that works but the, the courts are not protecting israel the courts themselves are part of the system. And I, I'm a great believer in the independence of the judiciary. I, I've always put great trust in the, in the court system. I think it's very important in any legal system. But I think the court system at the international level um, is weak. And I, and I don't say that lightly because I highly respect judges, I think, Many of them do great work. They're highly um, trained. They're, um, they're, they're honest people, but there are too few of them, unfortunately. Uh, and, and Andrew, uh, you know, international journalists, particularly from our mainstream media, whether it's BBC, whether it's Sky, whether it's CNN, um, even France 24 love to use the term that Israel's in breach of international law, whether it's the Jewish pioneers in Judea and Samaria saying how that Israel, how this is being illegally uh, occupied. And uh, we see uh, that Israel's in breach of international law when she defends herself against a genocidal terrorist organization like Hamas. Um, just share with us what this actually means when our mainstream media and our, our international diplomats, those in the UN, constantly refer to Israel as breaking international law. Well, look, Israel, of course, is breaching international law. I mean, every every country breaches international law. So there's no such thing as a nation that 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 is perfectly complying with international law. Um, the problem is we, we've we've created a system of international human rights law, right? So this has become the dominant paradigm since the 1970s. So in 1945, when the UN was created, there was no such thing as human rights, international human rights law. There were evolving principles. Um, uh, and I mentioned the international legal jurists, one of them, Hirsch Lauterpacht, the most famous international lawyer of the 20th century, was Jewish, a survivor of the Holocaust, born and grew up in Lviv in Poland and studied in, uh, in Vienna and became a leading lawyer in London and appointed to the International Court of Justice, uh, was at one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel, but also one of the founding fathers of modern international human rights law, which places individuals instead of states at the center of the legal order. This is the fundamental shift. So the international law used to be about states and their interaction. It's now about the protection of the individual against the state. So the state is seen as the enemy of the individual. Um, and this means that international lawyers today in universities around the world are obsessed with human rights. That's really their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So that's the lens through which they look at Israel. Um, and Israel is no longer a Jewish homeland. It is a, an imperialist state that is mm -hmm. oppressing the minorities within the state and it's oppressing the people around them. It has one of the most advanced military uh, apparatuses in the world. It's highly funded. It's supported by the United States, which is also uh, considered to be an enemy of um, international human rights. So 
Israel is the colonialist occupying power. Um, it's very creation is seen as, a, as an infringement of international law because the Jews invaded Palestine from Europe. Uh, this is the narrative, right? And basically stole the land from the indigenous people. So when you have a legal system that plays into that narrative, it's very easy to manipulate uh, the system. And um, this is basically what's happening today. So since October the 7th, um, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, there were already preparations before it, but they're now being, a, we, we see a wave of cases. There are at least four cases before the International Court of Justice at the moment dealing with Israel. Mm -hmm. Two genocide cases, one case concerning uh, the status of Jerusalem, uh, and one uh, a, a request for an advisory opinion by the court from the General Assembly, uh, which I, I want to point out is perhaps the most dangerous of them. The court is being asked to rule that the occupation by Israel is uh, illegal. Mm. Now, how did this narrative of occupation arise? Well, let's go back to 1967. Uh, well, let's go back to 1948. State of Israel was created. Where was the State of Israel created? In Palestine, right? It came out of the mandate for Palestine. The Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel declares that Israel was created as a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. That's the Hebrew uh, description of the territory that Israel was established on. In other words, the boundaries were not firmly established at the time of its creation. And the Jewish people were basically fighting for their survival. And it's a miracle the state of Israel survived the war of independence against the Arab states that invaded it. 19 years later, they fought the Six Day War and miraculously won control over Judea and Samaria and the old city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And this is where the problem starts. The Jewish people and the state of Israel realized that Jerusalem is central and they incorporated the old city of Jerusalem and its environs into the city of Jerusalem and became the unified, undivided capital, the state of Israel. The United Nations immediately condemned that and said it's illegal, you can't do that. And they called on countries to move their embassies out of Jerusalem. Israel also made a strategic decision not to incorporate Judea and Samaria into the state of Israel, but to treat them as occupied territories. The word occupation refers to the law of occupation, which goes back to the late 19th century and later the Geneva Conventions, 1949. It's an established body of law. There are many occupied territories around the world. And Israel said, we will treat the Palestinians as, as um, protected people under the law of occupation. And this is where the narrative of occupation began. Um, and I think looking back, this was maybe, maybe a strategic mistake of Israel. Not, and it was understandable because the Palestinian population in the West Bank, as it had become known, was hostile. And the perception was the only way to achieve peace with the Palestinians is to separate from them. Hmm. And separation means that they have to have their own territory. And that territory should be the West Bank. So really the idea of a two-state solution came from um, mainly the secular left in Israel, which at the time was the majority. And the language of occupation came into being. And this is what they've turned around now and are using as a weapon against Israel to claim that the Palestinians now have the right to a state, avoiding any negotiations. 
and claiming that Israel now must withdraw from not only from Gaza, but also from the West Bank and East Jerusalem to allow the Palestinians to have a state, which is all well and good. Um, I also personally, I'm not opposed in principle to Palestinian statehood, but I think what we should be wary of is not just the Palestinians, it's all of the um, uh, the regimes like Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who are taking control of Palestinian society um, mm. and using the vehicle of Palestinian statehood to achieve their uh, annihilationist mm. uh, Islamic Jihad objectives, which has got nothing to do with a two-state solution. It's all about destroying the Jewish homeland. Mm -hmm. And this is what the world needs to understand, that this is not about Palestinian human rights or it's not about territory. Uh, it's about the very existence of the, of the state itself. And Angie, just uh, share your thoughts, because you're based in The Hague, you're defending Israel in The Hague, when you have like the Supreme uh, Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, um, Karim Khan, uh, QC, um, issuing an international arrest warrant for the rest of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as Israel's Defence Minister, and also the three leaders of Hamas in Gaza, and equating Hamas on the same moral equivalency as the state of Israel, when Israel abides by, by the rule of law, Israel is an independent democratic state with institutions, and Hamas is a totalitarian terrorist regime that oppresses their own people. Um, how can he make this moral equivalence between the two and also issue an arrest warrant for the Israeli Prime Minister, particularly when Israel hasn't signed up to the, uh, the Statue of Rome, it's not a signature of the International Criminal Court, and yet the International Criminal Court is going for Israel. Well, uh, well, first of all, the, the arrest warrants have not have not been issued yet, right? So the prosecutor, he it's the court itself which issues arrest warrants, and the prosecutor has asked the court to do it. The court still needs to make a decision uh, about that. Um, Karim Khan is in a is in a difficult position. I'll say that in his defence, um, the court has been captured in a way, I think, by the Palestinian uh, movement. His predecessor uh, really bought into the Palestinian narrative and made a decision that she would open an investigation into Israeli leaders. And so in a way, he's committed to that decision. Uh, he, he inherited it. Um, I think he's in many ways, well-meaning, but he's under tremendous political pr pressure from the Arab world, particularly to um, investigate Israeli leaders. I agree with you. I think it's outrageous that um, Israeli leaders are put on the same level as Hamas leaders. I think it's incredibly, uh, it's unbelievable that the international community and the court is not insisting that the hostages be returned before there's any question whatsoever of any legal proceedings against Israel. Um, so the whole system is being turned on its head in a way. Uh, the court itself made a decision three years ago, which, which Karim can't, can't overturn, and that is the court decided that it has jurisdiction here when, as you say, Israel is not a party to the ICC, which is so the court can only prosecute individual. The court prosecutes individuals, right? Not not states. So it can only prosecute individuals for crimes committed on the territory of state parties, or crimes committed by nationals of state parties, right? So Israel is not a state party. Um, Israel, like the United States and Russia and China and Iran and many other states, decided not to join this international criminal court. Um, many people are angry with Israel about that. You know, they think that they're avoiding the court. Um, but that's Israel's right. And Israel knew 
20 years ago that this system was going to be used against it, particularly in relation to settlements. That's why they decided not to sign up. Now, the big question then was, well, um, then what? It, maybe Palestine um, is a state. And Palestine signed up to the Rome Treaty in 2015, I believe, having been given UN non-member state status in the UN 2012. This gave Palestine a kind of standing in the court. And the court has decided that Palestine is not really a state, but it looks enough like a state to be a state party to the treaty, which is a kind of absurdity in itself. Um, so what they say is that crimes committed on the territory of Gaza is, is a crime committed on the state of Palestine's territory, just like crimes committed in the West Bank are crimes committed on the state, the territory of the state of Palestine. So therefore, the court has the right to uh, investigate Israeli leaders. It's a it's a totally crazy system. Um, the the other thing is the court is a court of last instance of it's intended only to have investigate and prosecute where national courts do not cannot or will not in good faith prosecute their own nationals for war crimes now israel will never prosecute its political leaders for the war crime war crimes committed in gaza it does take extensive proceedings to investigate and, where necessary, prosecute its own military leadership if there are crimes committed in Gaza. And let's face it, you know, there are, mistakes are made in this war and there will be decisions made by Israeli leaders that uh, were wrong and contrary to law. That, that always happens in a war. Yeah. Uh, but the legal system in Israel is robust and proceedings are taking place as we speak to investigate their own people. But the court, Karim Khan, has taken this to the next level by taking it, wanting to take Netanyahu and Gallant to court. Um, and th this is crazy. This is this is totally crazy. Mm. Uh, but it's a political move. It's a it's a highly political move. And he he knows it. And I think it's undermining the credibility of the court. It's further another nail, I think, in the coffin of the court, which has been a failure, a, a dismal failure. Um, it's costing, you know, multi, multi millions of dollars every year to be sustained. And I think it has a handful of prosecutions in just over 20 years. The system uh, hasn't worked. And this is a political showcase, really. Hmm. And, and Andrew, so we're coming to the end of sadly of this uh, Zoom event, and would love to do more with you. It, it should be if if the West had any moral courage or, or a moral compass left, it should be Hamas that's on trial, Iranian regime on trial, because Israel on October the seventh faced a Holocaust of its own. I'm going to hand over now to uh, to Pastor Mark Starbuck to uh, pray for tonight uh, and give us his final thoughts on tonight's proceeding, but we want to thank you so much. You're doing an incredible work uh, defending Israel in the arena that is international law, fighting against lawfare, but also giving us an insight into the legal battle and challenges that Israel faces, that we know how to be uh, praying more for Israel when it comes to these international law attacks, particularly for the International Criminal Court and the International Criminal Court of Justice. Over to you, Mark. Can I just, just say one word, Mark, before you pray, because I think it's about Jerusalem. Um, and the Bible tells us the nations will come up against Jerusalem. Yeah. So th this advisory opinion proceedings before the court, the court is being asked to determine on the status of the holy city of Jerusalem. Okay. First time in history mm. that a panel of judges appointed by nations are being asked to decide that the city of Jerusalem, or at least the most important part of the old city, including the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, belongs not to Israel or the Jewish people, but to the Palestinians. Wow. And I think this is very significant. 
So it's a matter of prayer, I think, that we pray into this and against um, and perhaps pray for confusion and that um, that the judges will act righteously. Um, so I, I just put that out there. I think it's yeah. good to be aware of. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you, Simon. And, of course, we remember the writings of Zechariah where he speaks of a day when Jerusalem will be like a drugged cup, uh, a cup of intoxication, uh, a fixation, if you could say. Uh, just a final word of encouragement to all of you who have joined us tonight on Zoom. Uh, do make sure that you're subscribed to our email, the ICJ UK email, as this will give you all the news about the ministry, events, projects, and of course, resources that are available for you to either download or purchase or get your hands on. Uh, of course, consider being with us at this year's Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the theme is By My Spirit. And uh, as planned at this moment in time, the feast will be back at the Binyane Hauma, the BHU, from the 16th to the 23rd of October. So we'd love to see you in Jerusalem with us for this year's feast. So let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this hour that we've been able to spend together. Thank you for the insights and the wisdom that Andrew has shared with us. And of course, as we've just been encouraged, we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel at this time. Even as the war on the northern border seems to be looming and growing and the threat of Hezbollah seems to be coming so prominent, Lord, we want to pray for your protection over the land of Israel, over the people of Israel, and over the city of Jerusalem. Give the leaders of Israel great courage and great wisdom at this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. And for Andrew, Lord, we pray that you will strengthen his hand, uh, give him uh, the, the skill of a surgeon to be able to, as it were, navigate and incise into the legal issues and the legal goings-on in the Hague and the world. And that, Lord, give him a voice, enlarge his voice, give, give him that prophetic measure, that measure of a hammer that is able to break in and break out. And Lord, we also want to pray for everyone who has joined us tonight, that, Lord, they would be encouraged, that they would be informed, that they'll have more understanding of some of what's going on in the world. And we commit this all to you, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. We ask for your blessing. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight on this live uh, Jerusalem Dispatch ICJ UK. You've done a great job and continue to do the great job that you're doing. Thank you for bringing us a real unique understanding in terms of the legal challenges that Israel faced, but also putting uh, Jerusalem back on our radar screen because we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we know that the nations are raging against Jerusalem. So thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank you all of those uh, who watched uh, tonight's live uh, Jerusalem Dispatch Zoom event. Pray that God's blessing will be upon you. Continue to support the ministry of ICJ UK. Continue to stand with Israel in these dark days and bring comfort to the Jewish people. Uh, thank you. And thank you for watching tonight's program. Shalom and God bless from us. Bye-bye.